the emerging issues like 5G, artificial intelligence, digital tax, e-learning, smart cities, and fintech is none other than Keith Andere, who is a professional internet consultant and digital rights activist based in Kenya. He has done extensive work on digital rights, including access to information, affordable internet, internet showdowns, shutdowns, cybersecurity, digital identity, and ICT policy in Kenya and across the African continent. He's also a youth engagement and policy advocacy expert where he has extensive engagement on various regional and global processes. He's worked on various campaigns and he's also involved in youth movement building, working, and also working closely with youth networks. Keith serves as a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group for Kenya IGF, as well as the African IGF. It doesn't get better than that. He is also the founding coordinator for the African Youth IGF, season to the core and to the bone and marrow. Thank you once again and welcome, Keith, as you take over the session. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Ian. I mean, you've done tremendous introduction. I'm wondering whether this is me uh, who are introducing. But ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth session of the Kenya Internet Governance Forum. Uh, I promise you it's going to be the most exciting session. For us, we are going to discuss about uh, emerging issues, looking at 5G, looking at artificial intelligence, you know, looking at um, uh, fintech, looking at e-learning, looking at digital tax. Um, and I invite you to just, you know, walk and have this conversation with us. We want to have it as much as in, uh, possible that you can engage. Uh, put up your question, put up your comments right on the um, Q&A. And I'll be very happy to grab those uh, comments and uh, bring uh, my panelists into the discussion into it. So we'll go right into it. And with me, I have a very exciting uh, panel. Uh, first of all, we have um, Nixon Omondi, is a digital service uh, tax expert from the KRA. Uh, we also have uh, Stephen Kamuya, the director of uh, Key Accounts Group, Huawei Kenya. We have Dr. Isaac uh, Rutenberg, Center of uh, Intellectual Property and Information um, Technology Law, CIPIT from the Stratmore University. Uh, with us also, we have Penina Kimani, uh, the Chief um, Digital Officer, Lonro Publishers. We also have Mary Mwangi, uh, CEO, Data Integrated. And we have um, Stella Muhoro, uh, Chief Manager, Business Development, Konza Technos. So I'll just invite all my panelists to say a word or two about themselves and why they are here, why are they interested in this session. Uh, and I'll start uh, off with Nixon Omondi. Yes, yes uh, 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 Thank, Thank you, you Kate. Kate. Welcome, Welcome Nixon. Nixon. Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you from afar, but we can hear you. I, I, I hear about a bit of echo. I don't know whether it's uh, good. That's better now. Uh, so to our participants and uh, my fellow uh, panelists, it's a great honor and pleasure uh, to be in such a forum uh, representing my commissioner, uh, Madam Ruth, uh, Rispas Mio, uh, together with our Commissioner General. Uh, so uh, tax, you know, as we know, is that uh, there are two things that are certain. Uh, that is tax and debt. Of course, I'm talking about it not on the negative side, but we know that to move our country forward, then taxes are a necessity for the government to provide uh, services and goods that are public in nature. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Keith, uh, thank you for the, such an honor. Uh, Nixon Omondi, I'm uh, the manager in charge of digital service tax from Kenya Revenue Authority. Welcome. Thank you so much, Nixon. Uh, I'll invite the next uh, panelist, uh, Stephen Kamuya. Yeah, thanks a lot, the host, uh, uh, working in Wahwe. And uh, I'm here especially to represent uh, from the private sector. Uh, my participation will be focusing on the 5G, um, which is uh, an emerging uh, uh, topic globally. Uh, and uh, I look forward to contribute uh, in this uh, aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Isaac Rotenberg of CPT. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here. And I'm Isaac Rutenberg, the director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University. 
uh, also a lecturer at, uh, at Strathmore in the law school, and um, really excited to talk about artificial intelligence. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Isaac, and welcome to the panel. Uh, I'd like to invite um, Penina. Thank you, Keith. I hope I have as much energy. I was wondering what you guys had for lunch when you started uh, introducing yourselves. So I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Longhorn Publishers. And I would say the most critical thing here for me is I'm excited to first and foremost like learn, engage, and most importantly, collaborate. Even just with the panelists here, I think there's a lot of things that we can do together to push forward um, our agenda and specifically ours as Longhorn when it comes to education. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Penina. We'll be looking to learn a bit more about um, education and e-learning. Uh, and I would like to invite Mary Mongi. Sorry, Mary, we can't quite hear you. Are you unmuted? We still cannot hear you, Mary. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. It's a global challenge, mute and unmute okay. situation. Eh? <laughs> I know, sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so glad to be here. My name is Mary Mwangi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Data Integrated, which is a fintech. And so my biggest interest in these conversations will be looking at how the emerging issues are affecting fintech within this ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Stella to the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Stella from Konza Technopolis. Um, and today um, he, I'm very glad to be here among these um, bright minds. I seek to learn a lot about um, the possibilities and the opportunities brought about by the new uh, digital uh, dispensation. And I'd like to, um, I look forward to the opportunity to talk a little more about uh, smart cities, uh, with Konza being, of course, uh, having the ambition of being Africa's smartest city. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I promised you that we are going to have a very powerful uh, panel and here they are. So we are going to dive straight into it. And Nixon, um, I'm going to take one for you. Uh, in light of COVID-19, we've seen a lot of um, e-commerce taking shape. Um, you know, people preferring to even have, uh, you know, deliveries and ordering online. So I'd like to quickly ask you, uh, what is the impact of digital service tax on uh, e-commerce here in Kenya? Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, when, when we look at uh, e-commerce and the effect of digitalization, we all appreciate that uh, it cannot be segmented to be an industry on its own. Basically, the whole economy is being digitalized. And with that, uh, we also need to move taxation from the brick and mortar basis uh, to the digital realm. And uh, when you look at uh, taxation uh, and how it affects the digital economy or digitalization, it can be approached from very many spheres. Uh, there are already taxes uh, that are uh, impacting on uh, uh, the digital sphere. Uh, some of you are aware that when you uh, purchase data uh, or when you transact, uh, you know, in terms of data, you are either providing data, then there are taxes that are uh, chargeable as part of consumption tax, uh, such as excise, uh, VAT, and such like. Then there are also taxes that were introduced uh, in 2020 that took effect from 1st of January, that is the digital service tax and also VAT, uh, specifically dealing with those who are non-residents, that is those who are not ordinarily based in Kenya. So all these taxes, they go to serve uh, the good, you know, that is provided by the government or the services that uh, our Kenyans need. You're imagining that uh, the government is working on the last mile in terms of, uh, you know, provision of fiber uh, network. For the government to do that, then it must get enough funding, enough revenue, uh, you know, to ensure that all Kenyans are connected and are able to access the digital space. Uh, but we also know that uh, some of the taxes lead to increase uh, in the prices of, 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 of either data 
or the digital services that we Kenyans consume. And, uh, uh, you know, the role of the government, apart from raising revenue, uh, with respect to that, is also to ensure there's redistribution of uh, income and wealth. And in that manner, we are able to access uh, you and me who might not have been capable of uh, acquiring those services uh, then get to acquire them at a cheaper price when you look at the last mic. So the effect of tax on uh, digital services or the internet or data or such other subdivisions uh, can be looked at in those two, uh, you know, uh, ways, uh, Kate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you bring in a very interesting uh, dynamic where you're saying that, you know, it's part of these uh, taxes that go back into building infrastructure, you know, to um, allow digital uh, development around the Kenya um, as a country. Very but true. where we sit today, we don't see a lot of, you know, last mile um, happening in the sense that um, there are still many areas that are remaining unconnected, either because they don't have access to broadband or even, you know, the, the, the levies that um, counties are even charging around laying the fiber optic cables make it very impossible for telcos and private sector you know to to put up this infrastructure because the cost is actually pushed to the consumer do you think that uh, we need to revise you know uh, some of the ways that um, we are we are taxing and uh, 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 infrastructure development for ICT it, it, it is you know taxation is uh, a continuous uh, actually the tax policies are usually or continuously uh, developed and, and, and uh, made in a way that it can respond uh, to the happenings of the society. So yes, we cannot use the old you know, way of doing things, but we just need to tailor the policies with respect to tax, with respect to levies, so that it is a win-win situation. Uh, I cannot speak authoritatively for some of our policymakers, but one thing I know is that the government has taken keen interest in ensuring that all Kenyans are able to access uh, not just internet, but it should be fast enough, and also, you know, in, 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 in those, uh, let me say, quantities that uh, will serve uh, the purpose to which, you know, our Kenyans want to access uh, the digital sphere. So yes, policy will be necessary, but allow me to leave it for those other government agencies uh, maybe to work on the same. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, Nixon. And I think we'll just uh, pick bank on what we are talking about and bring in um, Steve. Uh, from Huawei, um, and, and let us now put the lens into 5G and broadband. Um, and, and Steve, this is my question to you. Uh, in the context of 5G and uh, you know, broadband access around the country, what do you think are some of the gaps and opportunities uh, that exist here in Kenya? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one of the uh, biggest gap we have in Kenya is uh, in terms of uh, coverage. Um, when, we, when the COVID hit our country, it was clear that the digital divide is a reality in our country. Now, 5G, um, uh, for the purpose of the audience, we can say it's an evolution of uh, the cellular technology, which will enable uh, you know, the wireless to have high speed and uh, high speed data and also, you know, um, to have uh, low latency in a nutshell. Uh, when we come to 5G, uh, spectrum allocation by the regulator will be an important aspect, uh, whereby the regulator needs to make the spectrum license for 5G available and also at affordable price. This will help uh, the MNOs, the operators, to be able to invest more on the network coverage or construction to be able to to close up the gaps which are evident especially on the uh, on the digit, uh, as we can see in the digital divide uh, 5g uh, will be an enabler of what we call uh, autonomous application because with 5g we'll be able to see a lot of um, applications in industry for example uh, in the developed countries, we can uh, there is what we call connected uh, vehicles. We'll see a lot of a lot of application in agriculture. We'll see a lot of uh, application even um, you know in the transport uh, industry like smart uh, smart uh, ports. 
and uh, on the mobile, uh, what you call the, uh, the mobile broadband with 5G, then the users, oh, because of the COVID situation, we find a lot of people are work, still working at home. Uh, there are challenges because of network coverage and uh, the network stability is not also good. With 5G, we'll be able to, you know, to, to have better user experience. Um, so I think these gaps can be closed, especially when all the stakeholders in our country can, uh, will have a consolidated strategy uh, to accelerate the 5G uh, you know, availability in our country. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and I'll just want again to um, um, bring in a, another dimension to what you just talked about, uh, that we need a 5G strategy and uh, you know, all stakeholders coming together. But where do we move from here? Um, you know, where do we move from here to make that possible? Um, because we still have a lot of uh, you know, areas that are still unconnected. We are getting excited about 5G and the possibilities of 5G, but many remote areas uh, in this country today are still not having you know, even access to 2G, access to 3G. It's making it uh, super impossible to even you know, uh, access government services, such as uh, renewing of uh, driver's license or application of a passport, if you don't have access to, um, to, to the internet. So how do we move from here? Yeah, um, one of the comments or statement uh, which the regulator uh, has, has clearly stated, especially using the Universal Service Fund, is to make sure there is connectivity, especially in the rural area. Basically, what motivates the MNOs to invest? It's if whatever they are going to invest is going to make a business sense, because the MNOs are uh, business-minded, really, uh, okay? If you look at the rural areas where there is poor coverage, we, even some areas we don't have 2G coverage or 3G coverage for that matter, the reason is because um, the population, the population in the rural area is not dense, and uh, the per capita, which means the income, the purchasing power of the people in the, in the rural area is not enough to avoid either the devices or even the, you know, um, the, the, the data. So the subsidy which CA, the regulator, has been uh, providing to, uh, to enable the MNOs to make network construction in the rural area is one of the area or the right direction to make sure that these rural areas which are not connected, they are connected. That's a very positive direction. However, uh, we hope and advocate that uh, more of this uh, kind of connectivity through USF can be accelerated. This will help to reduce on the uh, you know, digital divide. Number two, we have uh, a treasure in our country called NOFBI, National Optical Fiber Infrastructure. This is literally covering uh, all the 49 uh, counties. Um, but uh, we think it's still not fully maximized. There are certain uh, schools which um, they are very near to the last manhole of the North Bay. And there are other many government centers which are close to North Bay. Uh, we probably uh, could be a good strategy that uh, the government needs to relook on how to connect these um, schools. That will help a lot. Uh, so that beside the MBB uh, mobile broadband, uh, the fixed broadband like Wi-Fi will also be um, available even into some rural areas, especially where there is no fee. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for those comments. Uh, and I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Isaac. And um, Isaac, my question to you is, uh, how has the changing legal and regulatory uh, frameworks and landscape affected um, the fintech ecosystem uh, here in Kenya? Well, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I think that uh, there are, well, you hear very frequently that uh, the law is slow to catch up to technology. Uh, and, and I really dislike that statement, actually. I think um, people who say that don't know their history, that uh, 
that's that's always been the case and, and most likely probably ought to be the case uh, if we tried to regulate and legalize or, or make legal frameworks for things we, we don't know or understand ahead of time we would dramatically affect the way those things evolve and so i think that um definitely there has been uh, a, a really good period in kenya where uh, something like mobile money uh, was essentially allowed to evolve into what it is today because uh, it was not subject to banking regulations as, as the banks are. Um, and then fintech is sort of going through that sort of that same period. However, during that period, there can be some real growing pains, and uh, we, we definitely see those. So, for example, um, there really isn't or there wasn't uh, initially a cap on uh, interest rates for certain fintech applications because they weren't considered to be like banking loans. Uh, certainly data protection issues didn't apply to uh, fintech and so you ended up with situations where uh, just about everybody on a, a borrower's uh, contact list gets contacted when that borrower defaults on a loan. Uh, those sorts of violations of privacy are really terrible, and um, you know, hopefully, the, the, hopefully, as as time goes on, we'll, we'll evolve and, and deal with situations like that. But that said, you know, we, we shouldn't try and regulate things too early either. I think that's a that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Isaac. Um, but just we can recall recently, the governor of um, Central Bank of Kenya. At some point in the recent past, actually, you know, listed some um, fintech companies uh, for violating of data privacy. You know, uh, people being called, and personally, I have an experience around that, where um, somebody took up uh, a loan from mobile money, and they, you know, are not even connected to me, but somehow gave my number as their next of kin. You know, and these people were actually just calling and buzzing my phone and saying, "You need to pay, or we will block your SMS, we will block your MPS, we will block your callings." Um, and and the, you know, the, the governor said, "Okay, we need to regulate these uh, areas." Do you think also self-regulation is also a mechanism to ensure that the industry all also you know, take the lead in terms of putting structures and policies that they can you know um, be be measured against by themselves? Is this a way to? Well, I, I Yes, over to you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, certainly your example is, is, is just one example where, where things went really badly for the, the average user. And you know, we, we published a report at CIPID recently on, on fintech apps that showed that the number of trackers that they install on your phone is just you know, pretty ridiculous. And the amount of data that they take and all of this is either completely without consent or uh, it's almost impossible to, to opt out of such things. So, I mean, there's no doubt that some of these fintech companies are really behaving badly from a data perspective, uh, data protection perspective. Um, <laughs> Self-regulation. I, I personally, uh, and based on you know experience and, and the, the, the uh, data that we've collected, I think it simply doesn't work um, for for most things. You, the one thing you can rely on is that companies will push the boundaries of the law to you know maximize revenue. That's why they exist, and and. Um, you know, if, if they take into account the well-being of the customer, it's only because that's in their best interest financially as well. So when their interests align, then you get, you know, you can have self-interest, you can have self-regulation, but if those interests are not really well aligned, you absolutely must have the regulator step in. Absolutely. Um, it might be very interesting also to um, hear Mary's um, comments on this. Uh, you know, having uh, her worked around fintech. Uh, Mary, do you want to chime in? Sure, definitely. Uh, it's very interesting, some of the uh, subjects. I've also been a victim of someone borrowing a loan, and then when it's not paid on time, they look at their list of everybody on their phone, and they start calling, trying to collect. So this is where you saw the central bank stepping in, and then um, I think there was a lot of abuse there because there was a lot of money to be made out of the interest rates that some of these uh, credit companies were charging. And so they were giving credit to everyone, even people that didn't deserve it. But then they also um, resulted in some unconventional ways in trying to collect. 
and this is where you see the regulators coming in because I do feel that um, there is a balance there is definitely a need for the regulators to be um, playing in the market but also to an extent I think the industry and the businesses even the fintechs also have to play a key role in terms of regulating themselves i see where dr isaac is saying that you know um there's not space for self-regulatory uh within a lot of the businesses and this is because they're always looking out for their self-interest i think there's that too but also i think there is also some kind of moral obligation depending on what the leadership is doing that they are able to regulate themselves is it everyone doing it no not really but then um to me when i look at it we have uh in fintech in kenya you have a lot of regulation you have a lot of agencies that are regulating the industry you have the communications authority of kenya you have the um, capital markets group you have the central bank you have the insurance regulatory bodies you have all the other ones the anti-money laundering the um, terrorists um, agency that makes sure that the funds are coming from not from terrorism and so when you look at the regulators roles in terms of where do they play and how do they come in and regulate and where do they strike that balance i think um it's a big white space because when regulators come in sometimes the regulation that they give is very broad so even though they want to regulate a specific thing within the industry there's still a lot of loopholes that you know businesses if their real intention is to try and circumvent or do okay not do so good we're not gonna say do evil but then there's still ways that they find to maneuver and what i feel like also the controls and the systems are really not there a lot of it for the regulators to catch some of this like uh, dr rotenberg said some of these are being implemented the data collection within your mobile phones or within places that you're going and they're collecting this data some of it is actually even offline that then comes online when you go to buildings you're leaving your id you're leaving your um, personal details and then uh, especially i've heard and we had this conversation in my office where we are asking do people use agency banking and they say we don't like to use agency banking why because even though the regulator is uh, regulating agency banking and saying how it works the person that's there are the the agent themselves they sell the personal data to other uh, companies that want to come and collect this information so as much as we are talking about the regulators coming in the most they do is set like an overall um you could say trend of this is where we want to be or intentions but in terms of do the businesses want to do the right thing i feel like most businesses uh do want to do the right thing there's a few that don't and so um for those yes the regulator can come in and say okay you didn't do this so in a way it's not to keep the straight guys straight but it's to make sure that the guys who go wrong there's consequences for them that's how i feel or i see the regulators kind of playing in this area thank you so much mary for highlighting you know really the role of a big brother in the name of a regulator and uh, you know how they can just help us uh, as businesses you know do the right thing and that those who do not do the right thing uh, are actually punished for it and severely i hope i want to bring a d interesting um, dynamic to uh, to this conversation of fintech and uh, i want to ask about artificial intelligence uh, you know in fintech are we seeing a lot of uh, uptake in uh, of artificial intelligence within the fintech sector mary back to you um I don't know when it comes to artificial intelligence I think there's a bit of it being applied but I'm especially in the credit sector in Kenya and that's where I'm seeing a lot of it um I'm not sure we have enough data to 
to defi definitively say that it's really uh, massively being used. I haven't, we haven't seen a lot of that. In case in point, I uh, went the other day trying to get a loan from the bank and you find that most of these financial institutions still use very archaic ways of verifying your credit of checking, of doing things, where I feel like if they had put some kind of artificial intelligence, it would help them in uh, running fast and things. But I do believe some of the credit companies, and the especially the ones who do a mobile, they do use a bit of that. Uh, but widely speaking in Kenya, uh, in the financial sector, it's not that much. As it should be. As it should be. So we're seeing a lot of opportunities for artificial intelligence around um, fintech going forward. Um, Penina, I have a question for you. Uh, the recent past, you know, there's been a lot of uh, news around education and the new curriculum, the CBC. Uh, specifically, you know, uh, if you recall, there's been conversation around um, printing of uh, assignments at home and, you know, projection in school. How has the country leveraged um, e-learning uh, in, in the light of uh, COVID-19? So I think the best place to start off with is to understand where were we pre-COVID, what has happened during COVID, and then what are the things that are moving us forward. So pre-COVID, we education happened in this physical building called a school. And then now COVID hit us, and we now had to shift our mindset, start understanding that this knowledge transfer education doesn't have to take place in a school. It can take place through a multitude of different media. So first and foremost, it's about that shift in mindset. Um, and then beyond that, we have to start understanding that what are the different ways that this can take place and what are the structural or cultural things that impede or provide us um, as, a, as a medium to success for both of these things. And of course, when I think about culturally, and I think most parents, I heard this a lot, most parents during COVID said they did not appreciate the amount of work that teachers were doing now that they had to be at home with their, with their children, right? So teachers are instrumental to learning, but I think that when we're thinking about how education has to keep changing and altering, specifically understanding that there's a new paradigm of students. These kids are highly, highly engaged. Um, they've grown up with technology. Uh, I think a three-year-old can probably use a device better than all of us here. Um, they're used to highly engaging content, whether they're playing, you know, PlayStation or any like computer software games and the world in which that we're preparing them for which is the purpose of education is also like um, highly digital and now we're thinking about how do we collaborate in, through different mediums I mean look at what we're doing here today um, we're not in the same physical space we're using technology to have these conversations in the same way assignments can be done offline at home and uh, sent to teachers. Of course, with that in mind, there are structural issues that come into place. So for instance, um, access to devices, cost of data, or even knowledge about which solutions um, parents, schools can use. For instance, you know, Longhorn has an e-learning application. So there's a myriad of factors that um, are affecting the current education space, but I think mostly it boils down to mindset. Thank you, Penina. As a chief digital officer of a leading publisher, how is um, Londra, for example, or publishers uh, in general, also adopting to the new ways of learning and the e-learning in terms of, um, you know, digital content and curriculum development? Because I think, you know, we are seeing a shift from uh, the normal kind of, um, you know, um, content in books to now digital kind of content. How, how is this for you? Okay. So first and foremost, I'll say uh, I have the best job. So I get to spend time listening to the needs of parents, uh, students, learners themselves and teachers and understanding what are the pain points that they're facing in their day to day and then now developing learning solutions for them. Um, that, that is a premise of what we do. So if you're thinking about the new curriculum, even our 
curriculum uh, institution, KICD, is pushing for uh, digital transformation in education, right? So some of this content does even have to be on the syllabus um, accessed through um, a computer media, because they do understand that the world in which we're preparing our students for is highly digital. Um, when I think about the future of education and what it is that we're doing specifically at Longhorn is understanding that first and foremost, there needs to be a 24 seven on demand access to content, right? We learn differently and we experience information in very different ways. And so, like I've said, now you have Gen Alpha coming into the job market soon. Um, youth are so used to content in a multitude of different formats. So can we provide them content in you know audio visual formats that's fun and engaging i think that's the most important element for me um i want to change the narrative when we're thinking about school you know how kids when they go to kindergarten they're so excited and then as you keep progressing slowly throughout the years you're so apprehensive about school right and that's because you're not understanding um, a lot of the information that's being given to you. You're apprehensive about it. And so I think that we as, as publishers have a specific role to play in how we disseminate this information. Can we give students a personalized learning experience? And actually we're doing this now through the use of AI, machine learning and adaptive learning. And this, if I can give a, a little story about myself, is very personal. So I remember um, probably like 10, and I was given math homework. I used to be that really good student. Yeah? I, I come home, I sit down, I don't need my parents tell me to study, and I'm looking at my math homework and I'm trying to figure it out. And to this day, I can remember exactly how I felt in that moment. And I felt so, frustrated i i couldn't understand it um my mom comes home finds me in tears over my my homework and she's like what's going on i'm like i just can't understand so she gets emotional with me and thankfully my uncle came home that day and he was able to explain the same concept to me but in a different way and i understood it and actually went on to really like math and i have a background in finance so can we use technology to provide students with content in the way that they learn, right? And can we give teachers the tools to empower them to know this is how the student needs content disseminated to them, this is how the student learns, and just make it easier for both the learner and the instructor so that we can ensure that all our students have um, the opportunity to succeed. Wow, thank you so much. Um for those comments and uh, i'd like to um, speak to stella uh, for the last 10 years or so we've seen kenya putting up um, you know the konza technopolis uh, the smart city and many of us cannot quite you know really understand the whole you know smart city concept so two quick questions for you what is a smart city and why do we need it as a country Stella, can you okay, hear me? Um, yes, Super. yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Fantastic. Okay, so um, typically a smart city um, is, um, generally speaking, a city that uh, uses ICT or incorporates um, ICT to enhance uh, the quality of life uh, in a city and performance uh, of um, urban services, um, such as energy, transportation, uh, utilities, and the like, um, in order, of course, to reduce uh, the consumption, uh, increase efficiency, uh, reduce cost, generally um why why we move into into urban areas so um that that's a very um gener generic um definition of what a smart city is so konza as a smart city uh because it is a city that is being built from scratch um we are building the city already uh providing for uh, sat capability already um putting in um infrastructure that supports such that uh even uh, when it comes to new technologies that come up, uh, there will be already the city that provides uh, for, for, for scaling um, and has the ICT capability already um, in, in, included in the infrastructure development. Thank you. Um, and, and 
a question that many of us, you know, would try and uh, answer, you know, uh, from where we sit from. Um, do we need a new smart city or can we make, you know, some of the existing cities and towns smart? Okay. Um, of course, uh, it is possible to retrofit and um, put, uh, you know, the element of smartness in a city. Actually, many cities of the world that um, have, have, have made progression towards being smart cities were actually um, went through that uh, phase. But you find for a country such as ours, we found that uh, there was need to have a city um, that speaks to opening up opportunities in the digital um, economy uh, where we want to be able to attract into this region uh, investment and even uh, in terms of resources, including the human resources, that can be able to prefer to come and live um, in this part of the world. So what we seek to do is to build a city that meets um, international standards of any city, uh, of course, powered and enabled by, by ICT, that includes aspects such as um, security. Uh, we want a very secure city, uh, includes issues such as utilities. We envisage a city where blackouts are unknown, uh, in, uh, things such as um, capability that is embedded in the city such that you don't have to walk around looking for connection to utilities, looking for connection to internet. Um, you don't have the problems of uh, many of the urban areas like uh, traffic jam and congestion. All these uh, will leverage technology to be able to alleviate these challenges. So yes, we did need um, a, a new city because um, the existing cities, it would be extremely um, expensive I, I dare say and also uh this gave us a new start in modern times i think uh we don't have a city that has been built um in in, in this um era so it gave us a new uh, opportunity to start again and this has been done the world over we have a lot of new cities we have um uh delhi uh, the new delhi we in shanghai they built a new a new area so it, even in dubai they, they have a new a new area so we are just um going with what the others have done before and it has worked for them so we look forward to it working for us as well absolutely and we look forward to having you know um a, f a functional smart city very soon. Um, so I'll just come back to Nixon as we check uh, whether we have comments and questions at the Q&A and you know, try to understand from the KRE perspective um, how they're also utilizing emerging technologies you know, such as artificial intelligence, if at all any, uh, you know, to sort of uh, streamline the way they are doing taxation and profiling. Do you see a lot of um, use of emerging technologies within um, KRE? Systems. Yes, ye yes, Kate. Uh, you know, this is uh, an area that we cannot avoid uh, to venture into. So currently, if uh, for those who've uh, witnessed care do maybe audits or compliance checks, uh, they'll appreciate that we have gone into the data-driven uh, kind of uh, risk profiling and, and audit methodologies. So we are no longer, you know, choosing, for example, a case for the sake of it but it has to be driven by certain fundamentals which basically relies on a lot of data. Uh, we also have a, a unit that is coming up. We are actually trying to shore it up, uh, referred to as artificial intelligence and innovation unit. So once this unit is up, I think we'll engage the tools that have been stated uh, so that again, we try to increase compliance, but above all, to assist also in simplifying uh, our, our, our tax uh, processes and even the legal provisions, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nick. Um, Steve, I, I would like to quickly just uh, also try and understand from a um, uh, Huawei perspective. Uh, there has been this notion that, you know, uh, Huawei applications are very insecure, you know, and they are prodding into people's um, privacy. Uh, is this notion true? Um, thanks a lot. Uh, on the matters of politics, I do not want to comment. But uh, from the from the global perspective, uh, you know, our systems have been uh, have been used by our our you know customers. For example, even like in Safari in Kenya, Safaricom and other operators, we have been our partners with them for the last 20 years. They have never seen any vulnerability vulnerability in our solutions or systems. 
Um, and this has proven that we are trusted partners um, here and also globally. So um, I just wanted to, to comment on that in that aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for clearing the air. Um, I'm wondering whether the directors, my directors are able to uh, check if we have um, questions or comments from uh, the Q&A uh, section before we can come back to a round of um, workflows. Do we have that ready? Okay, as my directors work on uh, checking the, if we have any questions uh, and comments, and I still encourage you uh, viewers and participants to drop in your questions and comments at the Q&A section, and we'll be happy to grab them and bring uh, them into light. In the meantime, also, you are happy to um, share a tweet using the official hashtag, KEIGF2021, uh, and we'll come back and also try and read some of those interesting uh, conversations and tweets that you are having right there on Twitter. So we'll come back to all the panelists, and I uh, just want to ask, um, what are some of the two strategies uh, going forward that we can employ, um, you know, going forward? What are some of two strategies you would recommend um, that we can employ going forward? So we'll start with uh, Nixon. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, strategies to one. Uh, you know, we say that you bring the revenue to government, then government uh, plows back, plows back into the economy. Uh, I always talk of two strategies. Uh, one is integration, and the other one is collaboration. Actually, they are almost uh, synonyms. Uh, you know, integration in the sense that uh, with the digital sphere improving, we feel that our tax system should be integrated with the taxpayer systems. And that will not only simplify tax processes, but even compliance processes, payment processes, filing processes will be so simple. Uh, imagine uh, for those who file their return and have the opportunity to do uh, IT, uh, IT1 for employment only. The data is already pre-filled, and that gives you a lot of easy time uh, you know, to file your return and also to collect whatever information that you have that you need to. So integration is very important. Then the last one is collaboration. We keep on, uh, you know, sensitizing our taxpayers, giving them information on how to comply with our laws, with the regulations, with the processes, with the, you know, to ensure that uh, there is an enhanced voluntary tax compliance. If all our taxpayers collaborate with us, then I don't see why Kenya cannot be, you know, some of the top countries in the next few years. Thank you so much, uh, Nixon. I think uh, two things, collaboration and integration, very powerful. Um, Steve, from your context, what are some of the two strategies that we can employ going forward? Uh, I would want to speak about uh, what you call the 5G, um, 5G spectrum uh, strategy, which is very important, acceleration of 5G uh, spectrum strategy um, to enable to enable uh, acceleration of broadband. That's and of course again it speaks about collaboration again, uh, involving all the stakeholders. Number two on the strategy uh, is also what you call the national broadband strategy, which is incorporated by ensuring there's, there is access of uh, connectivity uh, across our country. That strategy is very important. It entails several action plans, uh, which I believe the stakeholders uh, are actioning on them. Hopefully that this can be accelerated so that this can boost our digital divide um, and, also, uh, and also help the current uh, um, scenarios which have been um, occasioned by COVID, and especially to make sure that every Kenyan can access to, um, to internet. That's very important. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Steve. Those are very powerful, you know, um, remarks right there on some of the strategies that we can, you know, employ, especially on the 5G, uh, you know, uh, strategy. Um, Dr. Isaac? 
Thank, thanks for the, the question also. Uh, I think that uh, I'm only going to give one uh, strategy and, and it's with respect to artificial intelligence. Um, AI is part of a suite of technologies we sometimes refer to as fourth industrial revolution technologies, which also includes 5G and, and some others. And these, um, actually apart from 5G, the rest of them are, are uh, gaining traction in many parts of Africa much more rapidly than 3, uh, 3G, 3IR technologies did. Uh, and one of the most important reasons is that there's um, a, a proliferation of open source uh, and open access technologies and, ac and resources. And so, you know, the average, um, the average technologist in, during the 3G revolution could not, uh, sorry, the 3IR tech revolution had no real input, but the average technologist in the fourth industrial revolution actually can with those, with those sorts of resources. You can get very small SMEs that are, you know, really innovating in, in artificial intelligence technologies that are completely unknown elsewhere in the world. And we've seen that in, in some instances. So I think that um, my policy advice would be to encourage those sorts of activities. Uh, the parliament did uh, was looking at, for example, an SME bill recently, um, helping out the, the, those sorts of, that sort of sector, I think, would really give us um, some interesting uh, interactions with the rest of the world and uh, make, make it more of a two-way street rather than what used to be a one-way street. We would consume technologies. We weren't actually developing and, and distributing our own technologies, but we do that now. Thank you so much, Dr. Isaac, um, for sharing that uh, powerful policy recommendation. Um, Penina, from uh, an e-learning perspective, what are some of the two strategies that we can employ uh, going forward? Um, actually, first, I want to go back to Nixon's point on collaboration. And I think that when we look at issues, we should look at them holistically. So if you're thinking about e-learning and for Nixon, uh, a better tax base, um, for, for, because the students that we are now teaching are the ones who are going to be the ones employed that he wants to tax, wouldn't it be beneficial to provide tax incentives now to education institutions, schools, uh, publishers, so that we can actually provide students with, a, with the best possible outcomes, and then that actually works in their favor in the long term. Um, so my first thing is, like, I think when we think about issues, it should always be collaboratively but holistically, not just within um, the paradigm of, of our sector. And then the second thing for me is, that we need to be very student-centric. Um, we need to understand the current mindset of our young learners. We need to understand the markets that they're going into and need to make sure that all of these aspects are aligned. So let us be student-centered in the way that we develop our education systems. Thank you so much, uh, Penina, for highlighting um, collaboration as still as a key element uh, of success, you know, going forward. Um, and Mary, do you want to share also some two um, strategies going forward? Um, for me, I think um, coming from startup world and the fintech world, I think what I would like to see is more of the uh, regulatory requirements, licensing and all the other certifications that you need. If we could have a one-stop place. For a fintech and for what we do, we are regu we have to report and get certificate and licenses from almost ten different agencies. And for each, you have to report every year. You have to get uh, the certifications renewed every year, and this can be quite tedious and expensive. So, if we could have like a one-stop place, like a chamber of commerce or something, where we all go and we get all this stuff done. Uh, would be really good for us. That's what I would hope uh, the government would make it easy to do registration. And even within the agencies, even though you are registering for one product, if you have a second similar product, you still have to go for a different certifications. And so when you count at the end of the year, how many certifications, how many uh, agencies you have to deal with, how much time you have to spend on it, it can be quite a bit. So I'm hoping that we can be able to consolidate all this into a one-stop place. 
Thank you so much, Mary. And I think that is also very important, you know, harmonization of uh, regulations and agencies to not only save on time, but to also save on money. I'm sure you're in business, and if you're incurring a lot of um, certification costs, then, you know, the end user gets to pay the bill uh, as there's no free lunch. Um, lastly, we would like to also hear from Stella, uh, what are some of the two strategies uh, that probably we can employ to uh, see more of, um, smart cities around the world and in Kenya? Okay, thank you. I think um, what I'd like to say is that uh, there needs to be deliberate effort uh, from the industry to increase um, the level of inclusivity among the uh, Kenyan, let me put in our context, the Kenyan um, population. I say this because we have invested quite a bit in terms of uh, providing infrastructure and capability, but we need also to spend also similar effort as an industry to build awareness uh, as to what is possible uh, with what we have. Um, I give an example of uh, many young people who, of course, have good access to internet, are very literate, um, and have uh, smartphones. But what is it they are doing with this? A lot of our, our young people and a lot of our users are actually consumers and not really creators. So I think that as an industry, um, we need to see more of an effort to, in, to have more inclusivity in terms of um, raising an awareness of what these technologies do. You all know the um, recent stories that have come about uh, 5G, a lot of um, incorrect information, I may say, about uh, it even causing COVID and things like that. We need to see uh, um, effort coming from this industry to disseminate information uh, that is um, accurate and that opens up possibilities such that people are not just looking for uh, bundles to, to either bet online or to watch uh, content, but really to do something uh, worthwhile that can bring economic opportunity. Sorry, we lost you a bit, Stella. Hello, Stella, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear you clearly? Yes, now I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay, brilliant. So I will say, uh, secondly, uh, f coming from a smart city, we really are interested in um, transforming uh, this country into a newly industrializing um, middle-income country, which we cannot do if we do not open up opportunities. And in this space that holds so much potential, that is a digital space. So um, we really then, as an industry, need to encourage uh, innovations around this space and allowing the innovations that come from here or the products that come from this market Market, to be deployed and used in this market, whether um, fundamental uh, change products or incremental uh, change products in terms of their innovativeness. I think as an industry, we need to be embracing more as opposed to um, pushing what already exists coming from other parts of the world without really creating an enabling environment for innovations to come up and for them to be deployed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, ladies and gentlemen, the powerful panelists that we have had today. Um, viewers and uh, all the audience, I promised you that we are going to have a very interesting uh, conversation, and I hope that you've actually enjoyed the conversation. And if you have, go right down at the chat section and find reactions. Just you know, give a round of applause um, to the powerful panelists uh, who have helped us unpack you know, this very interesting uh, session on emerging issues on various aspects um, that you know, they are really working and we've heard from them in terms of what are the next steps, what are some of the strategies that uh, key stakeholders can actually, you know, uh, work on going forward. And I believe you two are an integral part of um, this conversation. So I'm encouraging you also to also put it into the chat, put it into the tweet, what are some of the strategies, um, two of them, that we can recommend for us to take and going forward. That's all the time we had today in our Emerging uh, Issues session, and we hope that you continue to enjoy what is left of the Kenya IGF. Uh, Please follow the interesting conversation on Twitter with the hashtag KEIGF, and I'm sure there will be a lot more conversation. It doesn't end here. It only starts here.